Hello, Inspire Church family and those of you who have gathered around the country. We're so glad to be together today. Now is the time for all people from every land to come together. Now is the moment for worship. We enter in withholding nothing because he's worthy, he's exalted, he's high and lifted up. So join us as we sing praises to our Heavenly Father, our King, as we hear from God's Word today, and as we fellowship together in our homes, God will receive the glory. My heart is full of love and praises. I must have prayed a thousand prayers and sung a hundred songs, but I just have to say again. Oh, how I love you, more than words can say, in the deepest heartfelt way. So many melodies, yet yeah. allow me one more declaration. You are the lover of my soul, the center of my life. So I just have to say again, oh, how I love you, more than words can say, in the deepest heartfelt way. when you wake up in the morning you think something like this God thank you so much for this day it's truly a gift every day that we wake up and we're healthy is a gift from God so I would encourage you to think of words like this when you get up and start each day say this thank you for a brand new day a brand new chance to stand and say I love you For a brand new day, a brand new chance to stand and say, I love you. And then sometimes we say words like this. Oh, help me find the words to say, to tell you in a brand new way. I love you. Yes, I love you. Help me find the words. Help me find the words to say, to tell you in a brand new way. I love you. Yes, I love you.
that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done because of your love. today to Inspire Church. We are so thankful that you've joined us today for worship. I was thinking about this whole thing. You know, we're here in Sun City West uh, praising the Lord. Some of you are in all kinds of different places around the country. Uh, We have a gathered studio audience today worshiping together, but I know most of you are there in your office or your living room, you're sitting in a recliner, you're sitting on your couch, and it's really easy to just consider this as something to watch. And as I was thinking about worship today, what I wanted to do today was to encourage you to have expectations. So I want to ask you a question today. What do you expect out of this today? And, you know, if you're expecting good music, I know Pastor Brian and the worship team is going to do that. If you're expecting a good message, I'll do my best. But I hope that's not the limit of your expectations today. I hope you are expecting nothing less than a personal encounter with God Almighty. I believe that wherever you are today, here in the web room Sun City West, across Arizona, California, or some state in the United States, I believe that God, through his Holy Spirit, wants to touch your heart this afternoon. So I just encourage you to enter into this time today with expectations. Enter into it with an open heart and an open mind and see what God is going to do. One favor we do ask for you uh, today is if you are uh, viewing our worship service, participating in our worship service through Facebook, would you do us a favor, please, and just go down to the share button and uh, click on that and then share this worship time 
with your friends on Facebook. That's a great way for you to actually be an evangelist and get the good news of Jesus out to all kinds of people. So we want to ask you to do that. Just click on the share button and send this out across the world. As always, we are so thankful for those of you who uh, support this church financially. We're doing really well, and we're doing really well because of your amazing generosity. You keep hanging in there with us, and more than that, you're helping us move the church forward. And we just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, You've seen on your screen there ways that you can continue to support us. Now, before we continue on with our singing today, I would love for us to take a time to just pray together. So, Brian, if you could give us some music, please. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, I was so convicted today as I came to worship. Convicted in the belief and the assurance that you are going to touch people's lives this afternoon. God, I am just absolutely certain that your Holy Spirit is going to touch lives. God, I am absolutely certain that you are going to take those of us who are uh, frustrated with this entire situation in life right now. I am convinced that your Spirit is going to give us a sense of peace. God, some of us today are afraid. I am convinced that your Spirit's going to give us courage. God, some of us are filled with sorrow today. We are mourning. We claim the promise of your word. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And God, I'm convinced that you're going to do that today through your Holy Spirit. God, I am convinced that today as we study your word, your spirit is going to open up our minds so that we can see what you want us to see. God, I am convinced that your spirit will empower us to be not just hearers of your word today, but doers as well. And God, I am convinced that your Holy Spirit is going to fill our hearts today as we sing as we praise you, as we glorify you, as we honor you today. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name, amen. worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great things oh he of heaven you conquered the grave you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know you will do it again your promise is yes and amen you will do great things god you do great things oh hero of heaven you conquer the grave. You break every candle and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in 
your freedom awakened alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life, oh Jesus, I say your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, you have done great things, oh God, you do great things. of every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in one. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe And we live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart and to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is 
a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and to those around me holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will build upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken God we thank you for the ways that you provide for us. For times when we need comfort, God, you give comfort. When we're weary, God, you restore our soul. Lord, we look to you for all of our needs. And I can honestly say on this day, God, that you make me glad.
as I get set up, turn on my mic, as I get set up, uh, let's try something sort of fun today, a little bit different. Right there in your comment bar, take just a moment and finish this sentence for me. God is blank. Okay, God is, and put something about God in there that you appreciate, that you uh, love about Him. It might be God is holy, God is good, God is love, whatever. But just take a quick uh, moment there and type in the comment bar uh, something about God that you appreciate about Him. Way back in the day, Way back in the day, I used to play basketball all the time. It was uh, sort of my life. And in high school, uh, we'd often go down to uh, go down to our high school in Urbana and uh, play some pickup ball on the outdoor courts. Now we'd go down there, and there'd be a bunch of guys that want to play. And before we could play a game, the first thing we had to do was choose our sides. And for those of you that have been on the playground at some point in your life, you know how that usually goes. We would choose two people, maybe we would call those the captains, whatever. Uh, so if I was the captain and my buddy was the captain, uh, everybody else would line up in front of us. And then we would take turns choosing our team. So I might choose this guy, I point to him, I call out his name, and he'd come over and stand with me. And then the guy, the other captain, he would choose somebody, call his name, point to him, and that person would go over and stand by him. I would choose somebody, they'd stand by me, and we would go through until we had two teams of five each. That's how we picked teams, and it worked pretty well. We would usually end up with teams that were fairly balanced. It worked. The bad part about that method of dividing people like that was if you were the last guy picked. You ever been there? I'll be honest with you, I usually was never the last guy picked. I'm six foot five. It really helps when they're choosing teams for basketball. But invariably, somebody had to be the last guy picked. And what did that say? Basically, what it said was that your peers think that you're the worst guy on the two teams. You know the only thing worse than being picked last? Not being picked at all. Because sometimes there was more than 10 guys that wanted to play, and you might be the 11th guy that had to go sit down while everybody else played basketball. It was difficult, it was tough, and it was brutal, but we separated people that way. We made judgments about them, and we uh, decided who was going to play for us, who would play for the other team, or who wouldn't play for all. Right. Who wouldn't play at all? Basically, what we were doing was we were dividing people into winners and losers. I've noticed that that doesn't just happen on the, on the playground. It happens a lot in life as well, where we divide people. Just for fun, last night I, I hopped on Facebook and I, I decided to scroll down the news feed real quickly and see where I could see examples of people being divided into groups. And of course, right away as I went down through the news feed, I saw people being divided this way. Biden followers, Trump followers. As I continued, I quickly saw mask wearers, non-mask wearers. Uh, I saw Dodger fans, giant fans. Uh, I even saw people who like pineapple on their pizza and people who hate pineapple on their pizza. Some of it's funny, insignificant, but sometimes when we divide people, it's serious. It's not funny, particularly. When it happens in the church, we're going to look at something today called favoritism. Favoritism. And when favoritism raises its ugly head in the body of Jesus Christ, when it raises its ugly head in the church, we have issues. We have problems. So before we get to our passage today, here's the simple truth that I want you to grab a hold of, 
And I want you to file away here in your mind as we look at uh, God's Word. If you follow Jesus, you cannot show favoritism. If you follow Jesus, if you're a disciple, if you love Him, if you want to be like Him, you cannot show favoritism. Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 2. James chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting, into worship, wearing a gold ring, fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, stand there, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Today we continue our series from the book of James that we're calling Pressure Points. And the idea behind this series is that James identifies for us uh, pressure points. Uh, first week we called them kinks in the hoses. There are things that happen to us as believers in Jesus Christ that if we're not careful, they will cut off our growth spiritually. They will stifle the development of our faith and they will keep us from becoming the men and the women that God desires us to be. These are pressure points. And the book of James warns us that we need to deal, we need to identify the pressure points, and that we need to deal with them in our lives. Today's pressure point is favoritism. We need to watch out for favoritism. And James uses an example of worship. He says, just imagine two people come into worship. One person has all the bling. They've got the fancy rings, the fancy clothes. It's obvious they're what? Wealthy. Now also, the person that enters into your worship service is a poor man. Maybe he's a little dirty, his clothes are ragged, but obviously it, they're, they're two different people. And James says, what you might be tempted to do it's like choosing teams on the playground. You say to the wealthy man, here, let me give you the seat of honor. By the way, if you want to come down and be a part of our studio audience, every seat is a seat of honor. I will personally seat you. So you say to the wealthy man, hey, sit here in the special seat. That's more important people. And then you say to the Poor guy, stay out of the way, please. In James's day, in that culture, much more so than what we do today, where you sat was important. Anytime a group of people gathered, there were seats reserved for the VIPs. I guess that still happens today, depending where you go. I remember going to a church one time and a man very grumpily telling me, you're sitting in my seat. It happens. But even more than in modern day, in James's day, the place that a person sat reflected their status. I don't know if you remember, but uh, in Matthew, I think it was Matthew 20, uh, James and John, not this James, but James and John, the sons of thunder, they were brothers. Their mother came up to Jesus and he said, Hey Jesus, if you don't mind, could you do me a favor? She said, When you get to heaven, 
Could you save a seat for my son so that one can sit on your right and one can sit on your left? What was she asking? She was asking for special treatment for her boys. Jesus said, no, sorry, you don't understand how it works. Those seats are really saved for special people. The Bible tells us that even today, right now, Jesus is seated where? At the right hand of the Heavenly Father. The right hand of the Heavenly Father was the real, or is the real VIP seat. So in that world, in that time, it was common for important people to sit in the best seats. And we can just shove the poor people aside. Now you might say to yourself, what does that have to do with us today? Let me tell you a real story that happened to me. Probably about 20 years ago, in our church that I was serving, it was a Sunday morning, we did church on Sundays, and I'm sitting there before worship, and I'm watching people come into the sanctuary, and right before worship, a couple walks in. I'll call them the Joneses. I knew who the Joneses were right away. They never had been to our church, but they were prominent people in our small town. They were wealthy. They were uh, influential people. They were people of power in our community. And I said to myself, wow, the Joneses are here today. That's nice. We did our worship service. Right after worship, I mean, as soon as the benediction was done, one of the women in our church almost ran up to me. She said, Pastor, Pastor, did you see the Joneses were here today? I said, yeah, I, I noticed them. She goes, well, you need to make sure that, that like tomorrow, you need to go to their house and visit them. And we need to roll out the red carpet for the Joneses because we need people like that in our church. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of power and they can do so much for us. I remember thinking, wow, seriously? They're just people. But the truth is, favoritism, whether it was 2,000 years ago in James's day, or today in 2020, can still infect the church our hearts and affect how we see people. James teaches us a few things about what is wrong with favoritism. It's why it's bad. Uh, the first lesson, the first thing that's wrong, James says, about favoritism is that when we show favoritism, we are uh, assuming a role that we were never meant to occupy. We are assuming a role that we were never meant to occupy. In verse 4, James says, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's the first problem with favoritism. When we show favoritism, we are judging between people. You're worth my time, and you're not. I like you, I don't like you. And James says, the moment we do that, we assume the role of judge. Not political judge, but somebody who uh, makes decisions about people. There is only one person worthy to do that, and that is God. So what James is saying is that when we fall into the trap of favoritism, we are trying to play God. It's not good. The second problem with favoritism. James says when we show favoritism, we are behaving counter to God's ways. Every time we show favoritism, we are going just the opposite of the direction that God, uh, we're running counter to how God treats people. 
James says in verse 5, Has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world? Here's the thing that you need to discover about God if you haven't already. God has a soft spot for hurting people. God has a soft spot for the poor. God has a soft spot for the widow and the orphan. God has a soft spot for those who are oppressed. God has a soft spot for sinners. If you've been with us over the last month, you know we just finished a series of messages called Unlikely Heroes from the Old Testament. And one of the lessons we got from that series was God chooses the people that you would least expect So whenever we choose the rich people at the expense of the poor people, James says, don't you understand? You're doing just the opposite of what God does. Way back when I first began ministry, not only was I the lead pastor, I was the custodian I was also the youth pastor, and I did everything. And in our youth group, there were uh, two sisters, wonderful young ladies. And it was fascinating. They were so different from one another. One sister was outgoing. She was bright. She was vivacious. She had one of those personalities that lit up the room. The other sister was shy, quiet, and withdrawn, and frankly, in the youth group, you really didn't even notice her. And I remember thinking, sister number one is going to be a great leader in the church someday. She just had everything about her said leader. And I wondered if sister number two would ever amount to anything. What was I doing? I was judging between the two sisters. I was showing favoritism. And it was fascinating as those two young ladies grew into women. Sister number one just drifted away. And sister number two became a mighty follower of Jesus Christ, a woman with deep faith and a leader in her church. I would have chosen this sister for leadership. God chose this sister, this sister for leadership. When we show favoritism, we're acting just the opposite of the way God would. Lesson number three. When we show favoritism, we violate the second greatest commandment. We violate the second greatest commandment. Verse 8. James says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Some guy came up to Jesus one day and he said, uh, Master, teacher, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, commandments. Jesus said, here's the most important thing you can do. Commandment number one. Jesus said, love God, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus said that's the most important thing a person can do. Love God with everything they have. And then Jesus said, but there's a second commandment right below the first one. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Then he went on to say that these two commandments, loving God with everything you have, loving your neighbor as yourself, he says, all of the other commandments, all of the teaching of the prophets hang 
on these two commandments. It's the most important thing we can do. So the second most important thing we can do, as James calls it, the royal law, is to love our neighbors as ourselves. When we show favoritism, we're missing that second commandment. Yeah, I appreciate you, but I really don't appreciate you. I admire you, but eh, not so much you. I have need of you. You go to that. Which brings us to the fourth problem of favoritism. It's a sin. Not my words. It's James. Verse 9. James says, If you show favoritism, you sin. If you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as that's how serious this is. James says, in the church, and I would argue in our own lives, when we separate people into this group and this group, when we make judgments about people, when we show favoritism, it's a sin. We're guilty. That's why it's a pressure point. That's why it's serious. That's why we need to address it. How do we move from partiality to impartiality? How do we move away from favoritism? A couple of suggestions. The first thing I think that we need to do, and it would help us tremendously, is we need to realize that God actually loves everybody. Did you know that? God loves everyone. Can you say that with me? God loves everyone. I don't have that on the screen. It's not one of my points, but I would even add God loves everyone equally. Think of that song, the little kids Jesus loves the little children. You know that song? All the children of the world. How's it go? Red, yellow, black, and white. They are all precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. So if I begin to understand that God loves everyone equally, all of a sudden the fact that that person's rich and that person's poor doesn't change how God sees them. And it should not change how I see them either. So the first thing we need to do is to realize that God loves everyone. Secondly, we need to appreciate, this is so important, Jesus died for everyone. Jesus died for everyone. Would you say that with me? Jesus died for everyone. There is not a man woman or child on the face of this earth. And I checked just two weeks ago, 7.8 billion people. Jesus died for every one of them. So if Jesus died for them, it must mean what? He sure loves them an awful lot. So again, the rich person walks in, the poor person walks in, Jesus died for them both. And you know what? He died for you as well. So knowing that God loves everyone and that Jesus died for everyone brings us to the third thing that we can do. We need to treat everyone the way Jesus has treated you. The way Jesus has treated you, He's treated you with grace. I go to this all the time in Romans. All who sin and fall short of the glory of God. The rich man has sinned, the poor man has sinned, I have sinned, you have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and then Paul goes on in Romans to say the wages of sin is death. The 
bottom line is, uh, if God treated us God has chosen to treat us with grace. Our sins have been paid. And our lives are filled with grace. A significant aspect of the work of Jesus on the cross. You can read about it in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 says that Christ has broken down the barrier wall. Christ has broken down the differences. Jesus has broken down the walls that divide humanity in order to bring forth a new race of humankind. Men and women forgiven through the blood of Christ, filled with grace. Jesus has come into this world to break down the walls between the wealthy and the poor, the blacks and the whites. He has even come to break down the walls between Michigan fans and Ohio State fans. That was for my friends Larry and Rachel. <laughs> D.L. Moody, 150 years ago, made this observation. D.L. Moody said, I have never known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. I have never known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. That's my favoritism is such a critical pressure point for the church of Jesus Christ. A church that is filled with favoritism will never experience the full power of the Holy Spirit. If your life is filled with favoritism, if you're judging people, if you're dividing people, you will never experience the wonderful, incredible, full power of God's Holy Spirit. While the world divides people, while culture plays its favorites, while society separates us, the church must go against the flow. As a church, we must stand out for our unity. As a church, we must stand up for unity. The church has to be the one place where every life is valued. The church has to be the one place where every person is treated equally. The church has to be the one place where there is no favoritism, where everyone is respected, everyone is honored, and everyone is lifted up. We get this question fairly often at Inspire. Someone will text us or email us or send a message on Facebook, and they'll ask the question, am I welcome at Inspired Church. Brian, we've had that question, haven't we? Am I welcome at Inspired Church? And our answer is always the same. We welcome everyone. We don't care where you come from. We don't care what baggage you have. We don't care what you look like. We welcome everyone at Inspired Church. But we don't stop there. Because we welcome everyone to come and meet Jesus. And we welcome everyone to come and meet Jesus and develop a faith in their life. And we welcome everyone to come and meet Jesus and develop a faith and become 
disciples. Committed followers of Jesus. And we invite everyone to come to meet Jesus, to develop faith, to grow as disciples, and to begin to change the world for Him. That's what we're about. And we welcome you to come and be a part of what God is doing in our midst. Let's pray together. God, we just thank you today for your amazing heart for all people. God, we thank you for treating us with your amazing grace. we are saved by grace. Why then, O oh Lord, do we not extend that grace to other people? Forgive us when we have judged others when it's not been our place to judge. Forgive us, God, for those times when we've distinguished between people. When we've separated them into winners and losers. If it's just a matter of choosing up sides for basketball, it wouldn't be a big deal. But God, so often our attitude has kept people from meeting the Savior. I want to thank you, Lord, for Inspired Church. I want to thank you for creating a group of people where we at least try to welcome everyone. We fall short. I know that, God. But God, we want to be a church where people can come, anyone can come, and they can meet Jesus. And they can grow in Jesus. And they can change the world for Jesus. That is awesome. So God, today I just pray for my friends around the country. Speak to their hearts. Lift them up. Encourage them in Jesus' name. Amen.
simply pray and you say to God today I want to give my life to Jesus and I want to begin to follow him the rest of the days of my life if that's a decision that you want to make right now I would love to know about it so if you want to make that decision today I could ask that you do me a favor please since we can't just talk to each other could you take just a moment and type in the comment section, Today, I accepted Jesus. I'll try to get a hold of you so we can talk and pray together. Hey, to all of you, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. It has been great to be together. As we do every week, I want to invite you to stand up and receive the benediction. With your eyes wide open, may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, be yours today and forevermore as you go out in God's world, being God's people, doing God's work. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.